what is the Apocrypha? And so the Apocrypha consists of 14 or so books written after, and I'm going to pull up something here that this will help here. It's uh, 14 or so books written after the close of the Old Testament and before the New Testament. And so what I've done here is, uh, you know, th these are the 39 books of the Old Testament. These are the 27 of the New. And uh, if you go to, uh, this is, I believe, Bible Gateway, you can see here this additional, this third section here called Apocrypha, and it lists several books here. Different Different segments of Christendom throughout the world hold different books to be properly part of the Apocrypha. In other words, this is a, a list of a whole bunch of them. Different groups have different ones that they think are authoritative. Uh, so it's around 15 or so. That's the list of books. Let me show you how the dictionary defines the term Apocrypha. So what we're looking at right here. This is the Oxford English Dictionary. This is obviously the entry for Apocrypha. And so let's just look at the, the definition together. A writing or statement of doubtful authorship or authenticity. In other words, it's, it's, it's questionably authentic. It might be fake. Specifically, those books included in the Septuagint and Vulgate versions of the Old Testament which were not originally written in Hebrew and not counted genuine by Jews, they weren't viewed as actual scripture, and which at the Reformation were excluded from the sacred canon by the Protestant party as having no well-grounded claim to inspired authorship. That's what the Oxford English Dictionary says. I'll also show you the Webster's uh, 1828. So let's go there real quick. Uh, so this is the Webster's 1828 definition of Apocrypha. Literally such things as are not published, but in an appropriate sense, books whose, whose authors are not known, whose authenticity as inspired writings is not admitted and which are therefore not considered a part of the sacred canon of the Scripture. When the Jews published their sacred books, they called them canonical and divine, such as they did not publish were called apocryphal. The apocryphal books are received by the Romish church as canonical, but not by Protestants. So in looking at those different definitions, what is the apocrypha? Well, obviously what has happened is, is the following. There's 39 books of the Old Testament, there's 27 books of the New Testament, and then there are other books. For example, you may hear people talk about the lost books of the Bible, and the idea there is, well, the, there are other books that should have been included, but were not included, and the, the, the suggestion sometimes is made that the Bible is incomplete. Well, with the Apocrypha, there are a series of books that some say should be included, some say should be excluded, and of the folks that say they should be included, there's differing opinions as to which particular books ought to be included. For our purposes, something that is apocryphal is not canonical. In other words, it, it's not properly part of the canon of Scripture, in other words, the list of books that are that ought to be included. So with that understanding of what the Apocrypha is, a logical question that one would ask is, well, how was the canon determined? You know, in other words, so the Protestants have a canon of 66 books of Scripture. How was the canon determined? How do we know that they're right? Well, the, the Council of Nicaea, and this, by the way, I'll give you here the, the, the typical answer. When, when someone says, how was the canon determined? The, the most common answer that I have heard is people will say the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD determined what books should be included in the canon. In other words, how do we know? Well, there was a church council and the church council met, 
And the church council decided, well, these are the ones that are proper and ought to be included. And that happened to be the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. Well, there's a couple problems with that. The first problem is this. So this is, uh, this is from the Text and Canon Institute, and this is an article here. And you'll notice the title of the article, Did Nicaea Really Create the Bible? What, what's argued in this article is that the Council of Nicaea, when it met, didn't discuss the topic of the canon of Scripture. In other words, the list of what books should be included and excluded. So there's other, there's other articles like this, but my point is, the, the, the first issue is, is it a historical fact? Is it actually the case that the Council of Nicaea discussed and made a decision and said, these are the 66 books that ought to be included and the rest should not? So the first problem is, I don't know that the Council of Nicaea actually had this discussion. But the second problem, and this is the real problem, so let's even assume for the moment, let's assume the Council of Nicaea met and they said, well, here are the 66 books of Scripture. Even if the Council did, so what? Are church councils an infallible source of truth? They're not. So let me give you a for instance. From 1545 to 1563, the Council of Trent met. Now, when you think of that timing, 1545 to 1563, it's right after the Protestant Reformation began. Well, here are some things that were determined by the Council of Trent. And I'll give you just some bullet points here. The first thing is the Council of Trent condemned the principles of Protestantism. In other words, Protestantism is wrong. Things like sola fide, in other words, salvation only on the basis of faith. Sola scriptura, uh, that the only authority that is, uh, that is infallible is the scriptures. Those principles were condemned by the Council of Trent. The Council of Trent rejected the Protestant doctrine of justification th by faith alone. They said that was false. The Council of Trent established the church as the ultimate interpreter of Scripture with the Scriptures and church tradition being equally authoritative. In other words, the Scriptures count, but so do church traditions, and who tells you what the right answer is? Well, the church does. The Council of Trent reaffirmed the doctrine of purgatory. Purgatory is not mentioned anywhere in the Scriptures. It's, it's, it's a completely extra-biblical and false doctrine. The Council of Trent reaffirmed the efficacy of indulgences. And an indulgence is it's a way to reduce the amount of punishment that one has to undergo for sin. So the whole idea of purgatory is, after this life, you have to suffer for certain sins that you've committed. And you suffer in purgatory for a while, and then once you've suffered enough, then you can go to heaven, is the doctrine of purgatory. Well, indulgences are, if you acquire indulgences, sometimes it's by performing an act, sometimes it is by paying money, then when you purchase those indulgences, then you have to receive less punishment in purgatory. Now, obviously, this is unscriptural and this is wrong. The Council of Trent reaffirmed the veneration of relics. What is a relic? It's an object or article of religious significance from the past. It usually consists of the physical remains of a saint. In other words, body parts of saints that are no longer here. Does that do you any good? It really doesn't. Or the personal effects of the saint or venerated person preserved for purposes of veneration as a tangible memorial. Now, there's not a word in Scripture that would indicate that you should keep the body parts of departed saints and that it accomplishes something spiritual in your life. It just doesn't. The Council of Trent also reaffirmed the veneration of the Virgin Mary. Now, why, why did I go through all that? My point in, in going through that is simply to make this point. As you think about what is the foundation for our faith, it's not going to be in 
uh, church councils. It's not going to be in religious pronouncements that people make. Our, our authority is going to be in the scriptures themselves. So the idea that the canon of scripture was settled at the Council of Nicaea is, is just wrong. It, it's wrong, number one, because I don't think it was even discussed at the Council of Nicaea, but even if it was, a church council convened by Roman Emperor Constantine doesn't have authority as to what is true. It, it, it just, it, it's not effective. So then the question is, well, how was the canon of Scripture determined? And what I'm going to suggest to you is that the canon of Scripture was determined by the believing church over time. So look with me at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Verse 2. That ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Now here's what I want you to notice. When you examine Paul's epistles and you look at the order in which they're written, it becomes rather clear that 2 Thessalonians is the third epistle Paul writes. So he writes 13 as a whole, and this is the third, so it's pretty early on. It's you know the third, third earliest. What Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 2 is that people were forging the scriptures during his life. Right? In other words, he, he hadn't even written three epistles, and people were already sending false letters under his name. Notice what verse 2 says, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled. In other words, he's writing to people that he fears they will be troubled. Why would they be troubled? Neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us. In other words, a fake epistle, a forgery, something that was fraudulent, as that the day of Christ is at hand. So when you think of, of what Paul taught in terms of right division, he taught some very specific things about the dispensation of grace, about when it would end, about how that impacted the, 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 the timetable of history. Well, Paul's telling them, hey guys, you need to be aware, you need to understand, don't be troubled, even if you get a letter that's purportedly from us that talks about the day of Christ being at hand, it's fake. There's people writing fake things. In that, in that same epistle, just notice this, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, or get chapter 3, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 17, the salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. What Paul adopted was he was going to create a salutation at the end of, of each letter in his own hand because there were people producing forgeries at that time. So Paul adopted that as a mark of authenticity. What I'm getting at is this. As you think about the Apocrypha and whether these apocryphal, spurious, non-canonical writings should be included in the Scripture, understand even during Paul's life that was an issue because people were forging letters with false doctrine so that people would be unsettled, that they would be troubled. And they would pretend, they would act as if it was a letter from Paul. So Paul had to deal with this problem during his life. The church had to deal with this problem during his life. Now here's what one of the things that God did. So get with me Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now notice carefully what's going on in Ephesians chapter 4. 
it says, and he gave, past tense. God gave certain things. He gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. The reason he gave them in verse 12 is for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. In other words, think through this with me. One of the things that happened during Paul's lifetime is Paul is, is going on these missionary journeys to establish, the, to, to, to establish churches, and he would ordain elders and so on. He would create functioning local churches in different locations. Well, how were those churches supposed to function when they didn't have the completed Word of God? So think about it this way. When, when Paul writes Galatians, which is his first epistle, he sends it to Galatia. No surprise, right? But how are people in Corinth supposed to operate? How are people in Rome supposed to operate when they don't have Galatians? Because it's not, it hasn't been delivered to them yet. Now, now, to be clear, the early church would make copies of epistles and then circulate them to other churches, but you realize that didn't happen overnight. It took time to do that. And, oh, by the way, it took time for Paul to write the 13 epistles he wrote. If, if you take a look at, for example, Philemon, and Paul refers to himself as Paul the Aged, well, he wrote that near the end of his, his ministry, obviously, right? So how did the church function when the written Word of God wasn't even complete? Well, the answer was that God gave these spiritual gifts, apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers, so that the church could have the understanding they needed to know to function. Well, one of the things that that entailed then is because God gave apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers, they would have the ability to identify God's Word, what was accurate from what was apocryphal, what was non-canonical. So God equipped the early church with the capability to do that. And what happened over time, so Paul sent out Galatians, he sent out Romans, he sent out First and Second Corinthians. While, while that's happening, there's people sending out false letters. Well, what would occur is that when, let's just say the church in Corinth, when they would receive 1 Corinthians and they would recognize it as Scripture and realize that it would be for the good of the body of Christ, not just in Corinth, but around the world, to have a copy of, of 1 Corinthians and then 2 Corinthians, they would produce copies and send them to other churches. And so what happened was, the believing church determined the canonicity, the canon of Scripture, because there were epistles they chose to copy and epistles they chose not to copy, that they didn't recognize as authoritative. They were non-canonical because the gifts that God gave with the apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, they could identify what was true and what was false, and they only preserved what was true. God promised to preserve His Word. He never promised to preserve things that are false. And that's why the things that were false were allowed to disappear and decay and so on. They weren't recreated by the church. So with that understanding, let me give you then some specific reasons, and I'll give you three particular reasons, why the Apocrypha should not be included in the canon. See, people sometimes have this idea, well, what if there's some really important stuff in there that we need to have that we're missing, and maybe we don't really have the completed Word of God? Well, I'm going to give you three reasons why the Apocrypha should not be included in the canon. The first is this. None of the 14 or so, it's, it's a little bit more than that, books of the Apocrypha are ever quoted in the New Testament. So in other words, if you look at the Old Testament, the 39 books, these books uh, typically are frequently quoted in the New Testament. None, zero, of the Apocrypha are ever quoted in the New Testament, not even a single time. Now, just to be clear, there are some Old Testament books that are not quoted in the New Testament. Uh, examples of that are Ezra, Nehemiah, and so on. But the vast majority of the Old Testament is quoted in the New Testament, and not a single verse of the Apocrypha is ever quoted in the New Testament. So that's the first reason. The second reason that the books of the Apocrypha 
should not be included in the scripture is that the books of the Apocrypha teach things that are just flat out wrong, that are heresy. So let's take a look at this together. Um, we're going to look here. This is a uh, 1611 reprint, and what we're going to do here is we're going to look at uh, this book is The Wisdom of Solomon, and you can see there that the S was formed differently at that time. But this is The Wisdom of Solomon, and, 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 and not really. But The Wisdom of Solom Solomon is one of the apocryphal books, and you can see here that this is chapter 8, and we're going to look at verses uh, 19 and 20. So I'm going to scroll down here. And th this may be hard to read, so I'll just read it to you. We're in the Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 8, verses 19 and 20. For I was a witty child and had a good spirit. Yea, rather being good, I came into a body undefiled. Now there's some problems with that. You didn't come into a body undefiled. This is a corruptible body. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that. This body has a sin nature. No one on earth has a body that is undefiled. Now, one of the things I'd encourage you to do is if you have questions about whether the Apocrypha should be included or not, just read it. Just sit down and read it and, and see what it says. It's rather obvious that it's, it's not Scripture because it it differs from what Scripture says in several places. I'll give you another example here, and we're going to look at 2 Maccabees. So this is 2 Maccabees, and we're going to look uh, in... So it's 2 Maccabees here, you can see that. And we're going to look in chapter 12, and we're going to look at verses 43 to 45. Uh, so 2 Maccabees chapter 12, verses 43 to 45. And when he had made a gathering throughout the company to the sum of 2,000 drachmas of silver, he sent it to Jerusalem to offer a sin offering, doing therein very well and honestly, in that he was mindful of the resurrection. Verse 44. For if he had not hoped that they that, that they that were slain should have risen again, it had been superfluous and vain to pray for the dead. So I'm going to read that one again. This is verse 44. For if he had not hoped that they that were slain should have risen again, it had been superfluous and vain to to pray for the dead. In other words, what it's teaching there is it's appropriate to pray for the dead. Verse 45, And also in that he perceived that there was a great favor laid up for those that died godly. It was an holy and good thought. Whereupon he made a reconciliation for the dead that they might be delivered from sin. Now, those verses are teaching things that are plainly wrong. Verse 44 is teaching that you should pray for the dead. Does it do any good to pray for the dead? And, and the answer is it, it, it doesn't. I'll show you that in just a second. Verse 45 says that he made a reconciliation for the dead that they might be delivered from sin. Does that work? Can you... For someone who's already physically dead, can you make a reconciliation for sin to solve their sin problem so that they can be delivered from it? You just can't. Get, get Hebrews 9, verse 27. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. What happens when people die? Well, when people die, their eternal destiny is sealed at that point. They die, and the next thing that's going to happen to them is they are going to face judgment. 
This is why it's so critical for people to get saved in this life. When 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 says, now is the day of salvation, the, the, the whole point of that verse is you don't know if you'll have another second. You don't know when you'll die. You could die in a car accident in an hour. You could have a heart attack right now. You just don't know. You don't know any of those things. That is why you need to believe the gospel immediately as you hear it. When, when you hear it and you comprehend it, you, you need to trust the blood that the Lord Jesus Christ shed for you. Because when you die, your fate is sealed. There's, there's no changing it. For, for as a point of man wants to die, and after this, the judgment. Well, 2 Maccabees chapter 12 indicates the exact opposite. It, it, it says you can pray for the dead. And it says you can make a reconciliation for the dead that they might be delivered from, from sin. And you, you just can't do anything of the sort. It's not possible. So the second reason why the Apocrypha should not be included in the canon is that it, it teaches false doctrine that is, that is clearly false based upon simply reading other passages of Scripture. And then the third reason I'll give you as to why the Apocrypha should not be included in the canon is that the believing church rejected the authority of the Apocrypha. I'm not saying the church council. The church council, who, who cares what the church council says? But, but the believing church, in other words, the church that received the original autographs and that copied them and copied them and then over time preserved them through, through martyrs, right? Basically uh, copying the scriptures, teaching the scriptures, passing them on to the next generation. They rejected the authority of the Apocrypha. Now here's a question that comes up. Well, I, I hear those reasons, but what about the fact that the 1611 printing of the King James includes the Apocrypha. And so what I have here, uh, this is a, a 1611 edition. It's a reprint of the KJV from 1611, and it includes the Apocrypha. Oh, oh, this is scary. Uh, well, if, if the Apocrypha was in the 1611 printing, then we, we need it, obviously, because the 1611 was right. Or that's one crazy position. The other crazy position is, well, what that means is the 1611 is no good because the 1611 had the Apocrypha in it and the Apocrypha is bad. And so, you know, shame on the 1611. How dare you? Well, let's, let's be a little more tempered and measured and thoughtful in thinking about this. So the next thing we want to look at here is let me show you something. And I'm going to show you here uh, the Dewey Reams Bible. So the Dewey Reams Bible was translated uh, shortly before the 1611, and uh, it was translated as a response to the English versions of the scriptures prepared by the Protestants. So when you think of people like William Tyndale and Coverdale and uh, the Bishop's Bible and so on, those were, those were instances of authors translating the Textus Receptus, in other words, the Greek received text into English. Well, as a, as a result of that, in response to that, what the Catholic Church did is they created the Dewey Reams in the late 16th century. Now, what I'll just show you here, this is the Dewey Reams Bible, and we'll look at the, the Old Testament and, and look at the list of books. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, it looks similar to, to what the Protestants would have. But if you look carefully, all of a sudden you notice, wait a minute. So Ezra, Nehemiah, Tobit, Judith, Esther 1. What's, what's Esther 1? Maccabees 2, Maccabees, so on. Wisdom of Sirach. There's a bunch of things here that are apocryphal books. In other words, remember when we, I'll just take you back here for a minute. Remember when we were looking at the, the list of apocryphal books and, you know, we see on here, for example, Tobit and Judith and Greek Esther and, and so on. These apocryphal books, when you look at how the Dewey Reams treats them, it takes the apocryphal books and it shuffles them into the Old Testament in various places. You, you can see that here from the, the list of books. 
I want you to, to show you that that's not how the King James handled it. So let's go back to the King James. This is a 1611 reprint here. And so what I'm showing you here is this is uh, the table of contents. And right here, this section is the Old Testament. And then if you'll notice, it has a section here, the books called Apocrypha. And those are the uh, apocryphal books. And then here's the books in the New Testament. So, so notice fundamentally that when the, 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 the King James dealt with the Apocrypha, it didn't take the books of the Apocrypha and include them in the Old Testament like they were authoritative books. It didn't put them in the New Testament. It created a special section called Apocrypha, which again means non-canonical, and it put them right there. It, it, it treated them differently. Now, not just that, I want to show you that the very way the King James translators treated these books was different. So we're looking here at Malachi, which is the last Old Testament book. It's right before we're going to get into the Apocrypha. Now, if you look at the, the headings at the top, so the people and priest reproved, God witnesseth against sinners. You can see that the letters are a little different in how they were shaped. But what, what the 1611 did is for typical books, and you can see this throughout, it would have little summaries at the top as to the content of the page. Now, these are not inspired. They're just helpful material as people are flipping through the Bible to, to notice. So then notice what happens. So we're in Malachi, and then when you get to Malachi chapter 4, you'll see here it says the end of the prophets. And then notice what happens. Once you get out of the Old Testament, the KJV has the Apocrypha, and notice what it has at the top of the page. It has Apocrypha. So, in other words, it specifically views the Apocrypha as not being part of the prophets, because what does it say? The end of the prophets. So the prophets are done right here. This is something different. Now, notice this with me. Get Luke 24, 44. Luke 24, 44. Luke chapter 24 and verse 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, now notice this next part carefully, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. When, when the Lord summarizes the Old Testament, he summarizes it as three things, Moses, the prophets, and Psalms, okay? Well, the Apocrypha plainly is not Moses. It's not written by Moses, and it's plainly not Psalms. You can read it and, and see that. So what the Apocrypha would be, if it was anything, is it would be prophets, because it's not Moses and it's not Psalms. So if it's anything, it's prophets, but guess one thing that it most obviously is not. It's not prophets because at, at the end of Malachi, what did the King James translators put? The end of the prophets. So the Apocrypha, based upon the Lord's own definition in Luke 24, 44, is not part of the Scriptures. Now let me show you a couple things here now. So you see here where this is the, the coming and office of Elijah in Malachi. You see again where the headers summarize the content on the page. Notice what happens with the Apocrypha. It says Apocrypha, Apocrypha, and then let's go to the next page and see what the next page says. Apocrypha, 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 Apocrypha. Now we'll do this one more time. You may notice a pattern. Apocrypha, 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 Apocrypha. So what happens, and it does this for 100 pages, 
is literally every apocryphal book at the top of the page, it says, not canonical. It's like a warning. You know how, here's what happens today. Someone buys a chainsaw at, you know, at Home Depot, and they take it home, and you take it out of the box, and there's a little notice inside that says, do not use in the bathtub. And it says, do not use in the bathtub, because someone somewhere was crazy and decided they should use a chainsaw in the bathtub. And so someone advised them, hey, look, to avoid liability, we need to put a notice that, although you might think it's a good idea to use a chainsaw in the bathtub, you really shouldn't do it. It's not safe. Well, what the King James translators did, because I guess they anticipated people being crazy, every single page that has the Apocrypha, there's a warning at the top of the page that says this is not canonical. So don't tell me the King James translators treated the Apocrypha as part of Scripture. They went out of their way to tell the reader this is not part of Scripture. This is apocryphal. It's spurious. It's not canonical. And they wrote that on every page. Now notice this. You ready? We got to go to this next section here. So this is the end of 2 Maccabees. So let's scroll down here. And notice this, this is the end of the Apocrypha. In other words, here's the end of the section that was not canonical. In other words, we told you when the non-canonical section started. We told you at the top of every page. Now we told you when it ended, and here's where the New Testament starts. In other words, the KJV, by its very design, tells the reader, here's this section. It's not authentic. And we're reminding you of that in every way visually that we can. So then you say, well, wait a minute. Okay, fine, I, I get that. I can't fight that because you have all this evidence. But then why did the KJV translators include the Apocrypha? If, if, if they supposedly knew that it was bad, why did they do that? Well, I'm glad you asked. So let's look at this. So what is this? 15 rules of translation for the King James. So we won't spend a ton of time on this, but just so you understand, what happened in, in the early 1600s is there was the Hampton Court Conference, and there was the millenna, mill, millenna, millenary petition to King James where it was requested that a new version, a new translation of the Bible be produced. In the process of doing that, there were 15 rules that were given to the translators of the King James Version. In other words, while you're doing this work, there are some rules that we want you to follow. So these are called Bancroft's Rules. And we're going to look at rule number one. So this is rule number one of Bancroft's Rules. The ordinary Bible read in the church, commonly called the Bishop's Bible, to be followed and as little altered as the truth of the original will permit. So in other words, they were given a starting point. The King James translators were to start from the Bishop's Bible and then to alter it as little as the truth would permit. Well, let's take a look at the Bishop's Bible. So here's the Bishop's Bible. And what we're looking at here is we're looking at, this is, a, this is obviously a scan of a, of a 1568 Bishop's Bible. And you'll notice here, this, this is the Old Testament, the first part, the second part, the third part. And so it's the books of the Old Testament. And then notice what happens. They have a section here called the Apocrypha. So what happened? Well, the King James translators, if they were to follow Bancroft's rules, to match the bishops, what did the bishops have? The Apocrypha. So the KJV translators included the Apocrypha consistent with Bancroft's rules, but told you on every page that it was apocryphal, that it was not canonical. So what does this all tell us? What this tells us is that the Apocrypha is, is not canonical, it's spurious, it shouldn't be included in the scriptures. We know that not because of 
a church council, but because when you read the Apocrypha, it contains obviously false information that's, cons- that's inconsistent with Scripture. And the, the believing church did not copy and preserve the Apocrypha. What we've seen is it was included in the 1611, but it was called out into the 1611 as apocryphal. So that may leave you with one following question, and that's this. Okay, I get it that the Apocrypha should not be included in Scripture, but how do we really know that the church got it right? I mean, maybe they made a mistake, right? In other words, maybe they copied the wrong books. I'm going to give you something here to consider, and you can evaluate this. We're going to look at the book of Isaiah, and what I'm going to suggest to you is that the book of Isaiah, in its very structure, tells you what books should be in the Bible. So let me give you a for instance. The Bible has 66 books. There's 39 in the Old Testament. There's 27 in the New. There's 66 books in total. When you read Isaiah, Isaiah has 66 chapters. Well, you could say that's a coincidence. Keep that thought in your mind for for a bit. When scholars write about the book of Isaiah, they have something called the Deutero-Isaiah hypothesis. So here's a tip for everyone. If you want to sound really clever, whatever idea you have, if you find an obscure or a Latin word for it, and then you say that's the hypothesis, you sound very smart, very cultured. So they have the Deutero-Isaiah hypothesis. And all the Deutero-Isaiah hypothesis is is this. It says there were two Isaiahs. And their theory is, which I don't believe this for a second, but their theory is that one Isaiah wrote 1 to 39, and a different Isaiah wrote 40 to 66. And they say that because the the two halves of the book seem different. Well, the obvious, by the way, the Lord himself quotes from the first 39 books, and he quotes from the last 27 books. So the Lord thought that Isaiah wrote both of them. But my point being this, of those 66 books, Scholars recognize, well, there's like a, there's a transition here. The, 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 the second group of books is different from the first group of books. Get with me Isaiah chapter 1, verse 9. What I'm going to show you is this. We're going to go through some of the chapters of Isaiah. And we won't do every chapter for the sake of time. But we're going to go through several chapters of Isaiah, and we're going to notice a couple things. So Isaiah chapter 1, verse 9. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 9, Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. Well, in Isaiah 1, it mentions Sodom and Gomorrah. Where are Sodom and Gomorrah first mentioned in Scripture? Well, the answer is Genesis. And in fact, they're mentioned in Genesis chapter 10. So get Genesis 10, 19. Genesis 10, 19. And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as thou comest to Gerar, unto Gaza, as thou goest unto Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis 10, 19 is the first mention of Sodom in the Scriptures. And of course, after Genesis 10, 19, there's some other mentions in Genesis. But what I want you to notice is this. I would suggest to you that each chapter of Isaiah corresponds. It has a reference, a comparison to that book of the Bible. So in other words, Isaiah 1 is representative of, it's, it's relevant to Genesis, the first book of the Bible. I'll give you another example. So go to Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3. We'll read a couple verses here. 
Isaiah 2, 3, And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So what Isaiah 2, 3 talks about is going to the mountain of the Lord, and that out of Zion shall go forth the law. Do you know of anything in Exodus that talks about going to a mountain and getting some law? Well, Exodus 24, verse 12. Exodus chapter 24, verse 12. And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me in the mount and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone and a law. In other words, Isaiah 2, verse 3 describes what happens in Exodus 24, verse 12. Get Isaiah 2, verse 7. Their land also is full of silver and gold, neither is there any end of their treasures. Their land is also full of horses, neither is there any end of their chariots. So the land in Isaiah 2, verse 7 is full of silver and gold. Get Exodus 12, verse 35. Exodus 12, 35. And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, and they borrowed of the Egyptian jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they lent unto them such things as they required. Go back to Isaiah chapter 2, verse 8. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 8. Their land also is full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands that which their own fingers have made. So Isaiah 2 verse 8 is about people worshiping things they made with their hands. Does that remind you of Exodus? Yet Exodus 32 verse 8. Exodus 32 verse 8. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshiped it and have sacrificed thereunto, and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Now let's be clear on something. I'm not saying the entire book of Exodus is included in Isaiah chapter 2. It can't be, or else Isaiah chapter 2 would be as long as Exodus, and then Isaiah itself would have to be the entire Bible, so it doesn't do that. But when you read Isaiah 2, is it obviously referring to some things that happened in Exodus? Yes, it is. Get Isaiah 22. Isaiah 22 and verse 4. Isaiah 22 and verse 4. Therefore said I, look away from me. Does that remind you of anything? Get Song of Solomon chapter 1 verse 6. Song of Solomon chapter 1 verse 6. Look not upon me. Has almost the exact same phrase. You say, well, these things are coincidences. Get Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. Isaiah 40, verse 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3 is obviously talking about John the Baptist. Where do you first see John the Baptist? Well, you see him in the 40th book, the third chapter. Look at Matthew 3, verse 1. Matthew 3, verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Now, isn't that fascinating? In other words, in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, you see a reference to John the Baptist. When you go to the 40th book, the third chapter, guess who's there? John the Baptist. Get Isaiah 44, verse 17. Isaiah 44, verse 17. And the residue thereof he maketh a god, even his graven image. He falleth down unto it, and worshipeth it, and prayeth unto it, and saith, Deliver me for thou art my God. So there's the worshiping of a graven image in Isaiah 44, verse 17. Well, what's the 44th book of the Bible? It's a little book called 
Acts. Not so little, actually. We'll get Acts 17, verse 23. Acts 17, verse 23. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Well, Isaiah 44, verse 17, in other words, the 44th chapter, the 17th verse, is about worshiping a graven image. When you go to the 44th book, the 17th chapter, what do you find? You find the worshiping of this altar to the unknown God. Isaiah 45, verse 3. Isaiah 45, verse 3. So Isaiah 45 would obviously correspond to the book of Romans. Verse 3, And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places, that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. Isn't that incredible? Isaiah 45, verse 3, talks about treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places. What's the first book in the Bible that reveals the Pauline mystery? Well, it's, it's Romans in, in, in canonical order. It's not, it's not Acts, it's Romans. Isaiah 45, verse 9. Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the potsherds strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioneth it, What makest thou, or thy work? He hath no hands. Verse 10. Woe unto him that saith unto his father, What begettest thou? Or to the woman, What hast thou brought forth? Well, Isaiah 45, verse 9, 45th chapter, 9th verse, corresponds to the 45th book, Romans chapter 9. Look at Romans 9, verse 20. Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor? and another unto dishonor. Get Isaiah 45, 17. Isaiah 45, 17. But Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. Ye shall not be ashamed nor confounded, world without end. Well, Isaiah 45 obviously corresponds to the book of Romans. Look at Romans eleven twenty six. 26. Romans eleven twenty six, And so all Israel shall be saved. So Isaiah 45 lines up with Romans. Let's do one final one, Isaiah 66. So Isaiah 66, what book should it match? Obviously, the book of Revelation, the 66th book of the Bible. Isaiah 66, verse 7. Before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. So there's travailing and pain and then the deliverance of a man-child. Revelation 12, verse 13. And when the woman saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. One more, Isaiah 66, 22. Isaiah 66, 22. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. In Isaiah 66, verse 22, we read about the new heavens and the new earth. Guess what we read about in Revelation 21. Revelation 21, verse 1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Now let me be clear on what I'm saying here. I'm not saying that every verse of the Scripture is found in Isaiah. That's unworkable. That's impractical. That wouldn't make any sense. But what I'm saying is this. You've seen the following facts. Isaiah has 66 chapters. The Bible has 66 books. The first chapter of Isaiah clearly parallels some things that are written in Genesis. The second chapter... Moses, the 22nd chapter, Song of Solomon, the the 40th chapter, Matthew. And by the way, 
Isaiah 40, verse 3, Matthew 3, verse 1, the parallel is, 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 is perfect. Isaiah 44, Acts, Isaiah 45, Romans, Isaiah 66, Revelation. Now, are you going to say that's all coincidence? How did the writer of Isaiah know that? How did the writer of Isaiah know not only the 66 books, but the order of them? Think about that one. How did he know the order in which they would be laid out? Well, the answer is, The person that wrote Isaiah was pretty smart. It was God the Father who, with perfect knowledge of every single book of Scripture that would ever be written, recorded within Isaiah sufficient specificity that anyone looking at that would realize, guess what? The 66 books we have are obviously the ones that God wants us to have. Isaiah has 66 chapters, we have 66 books, and the 66 books we have match up not only in content, but in order with the way that Isaiah was written. So you don't need faith in a church council. You don't have to cross your fingers and hope it's right. God has indicated in His Word that you have the exact books that He wants you to have. So one more thought and I'll close. Who was it that promised to preserve the Word of God? Was it Moses? Was it Isaiah? Or was it God Himself? God Himself promised to preserve His Word. It wasn't the promise of man. So since God promised it, it has occurred. The question is not whether God has preserved His Word. The question is where God has preserved His Word. And spoiler, it is in the King James 1611 or the modern printings of the KJV that we have today. That's where God has decided to preserve His Word in English. Therefore, it is the proper view of faith to exclude the Apocrypha as not being canonical and not being something that God wanted preserved and read by the church.